creatures, monsters. They have been things that have been with you on your mind yeah. really since childhood. Can you talk about that? Yeah, no, it's it's absolutely true. And uh, uh, I I was the strangest kid at the earliest age. I was I was really really very peculiar. I was very pale. I was very thin, huh. and I had like Rutger Hauer blonde hair. <laughs> and I would I would button my 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 shirt all the way to the neck. And I would be very, very extremely quiet. I didn't talk. I watched. I, 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 I was obsessed with biology, painting, and monsters. Huh. And uh, I think that uh, I, I read an entire encyclopedia of art wow. when I was very young because my father, I read all the books my father bought for his library. I read uh, a regular encyclopedia and I read an encyclopedia of health which made me the youngest hypochondriac ever. <laughs> I, I could recite diseases and, and obstructions in every passage of the body, you know? And, and at the same time, there was a thing that happened in my mind that reflected what happened in my country. When, when the Spaniards came with the Catholic religion, there was a phenomenon called syncretism that had all the old gods from pre-Columbian religion fused with the Catholic imagery. Yeah. That happened also in the Caribbean and so forth. And... In my case, and it's not just a cute answer, it really happened, is my whole uh, dogma and, and cosmology of Catholicism feels with the monsters uh -huh. of the movies. Uh -huh. I found empathy and I found beauty in the monsters. I found them patron saints of imperfection and uh -huh. patron saints of otherness. And I, I, it, they truly became the cipher by which I could uh, phrase the world. And, and they've been, they, in the relationship I have with the genre is I'm not a fan. I'm not an acolyte. I'm, uh, I would say, a, 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 an evangelist, you know? Yeah, and I yeah, am yeah. I'm, I'm a guy that sits at the top of a column making strange movies <laughs> because it really is a, a, a spiritual quest for yeah, me. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. One of the films that's always mentioned that I want you to talk about a little bit, you know which one it is, uh, Creature of the Black Lagoon. Lagoon. Yeah. And you know, also the notion that I read, you know, which was so touched me when I read it that you said early on in an interview that, you know, why does the monster never get the girl? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so well, can you talk about that a little bit? Well, uh, yes. I, you know, I, I always, I think that uh, it takes very little for a uh, certain tessiture of spirit to feel disfranchised, you know? Yeah. We are made, many of us are made of a thinner glass than regular people. And we, and we resonate with the world in a way that is more delicate and more painful in many ways than, than your regular impulse. And I think that we feel outcasts. Yeah. No matter what. You can, have, you can have a mini scar, you can, have, you can be too dark, too light, too tall, too thin, too fat. Whatever it is that you, you have, you feel you, that outcast. And I think the monsters, uh, you start pouring that empathy to them. And that's what happened to me. And I really had this vision of Julie Adams swimming over the Gilman in Creature from the Black Lagoon. Mm -hmm. And I thought that's the most beautiful image I've ever seen. And I, and I really, at age six, I really thought it, they're going to end well. <laughs> they're going to end up together. It was the first time I saw it. And when, when, when it ended really, really bad, I thought, I got to correct this. <laughs> and and I, it took about 47 years to correct it. Yeah. <laughs> So Vanessa, what about your back? Do you have a similar interest in this kind of stuff from when you were a child? No, um, <laughs> and I don't. I'm not. I I always listening to Guillermo. I find him so, to be so incredibly knowledgeable and erudite, and I just don't have uh, the same breadth of knowledge. I I do feel. I mean, I suppose we all most writers, you know, I was an outsider. I felt like I was a lonely child. I certainly relate to all of that. I just, uh, I hadn't quite understood that monsters were the answer. <laughs> it took me a while to figure yeah. it out. Now, but also, you know, one of the questions, I think one of the things I really love about this film, and I wonder if it figures in both of your work, not only the work here, but the other work you've done, uh, genre, you know, there's a belief in genre and a feeling that genre has beauty and strength. I very much feel that. I can feel it from both of your work. So if you could both talk about that a little bit. Well, I, I really, again, I'm not particularly educated in, in genre. I simply love fantasy and the sort of what if of it all. And I find it so freeing 
you know, I, I like all kinds of different writing, and of course I've done things based on true stories, but there's just such a freedom in being in a fantasy world, and I, I don't find it at all um, a stretch to relate to those worlds. I always find myself, you know, it's just like you're being invited into a better sandbox. If it's got <laughs> magic or some sort of fantasy element, I feel like this is great. You know, it's like, it's kind of like you're in the movie. Yeah. Um, and I, so I just, I really love those opportunities. Yeah. Well, to, to me, uh, see, uh, what I, what, uh, the more, the older I get, the less I know what genre I do. Because I really huh. just do what I want. <laughs> and at this point, uh, I'm completely fluid about it. Mm. You know, the only matrix that I follow instinctively is the fairy tale. Yeah. And that is yeah. true from Kronos until now. Yeah. Mm, and it, it started as an instinct, and it became depurated as a work ethic and a way of seeing the world. And I find that is because I know quite a bit about it. I know the mechanisms, but I'm also completely overtaken by its magic. And that allows me to circulate between musical, thriller, comedy, melodrama, which is one thing that makes this movie extremely difficult. It's very hard to explain, but tonally, yeah. to transition through all those colors, uh, I couldn't have made this movie until now, after 25 years yeah. as a filmmaker. Because if I try this at age 35, I fail. Yeah. You know, But uh, now, now there is that... That fluidity, which is the most effortless feeling in a movie, is actually the hardest, hardest thing to thing achieve. To, yeah. 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 No, it's true. When I first saw this, and I tried to, people said, well, "What's you know?" It's very hard to tell people what it is. And know. no matter what you say, it sounds crappy. Yeah. Yeah. You can see. You can no, look at people. It's a things. woman that falls in love with an amphibian man <laughs> in a secret government facility uh, with Russian spy. Uh, Stop talking. Yeah. I Buy know. me a ticket or go away. No, yeah. it's true. People get that look in their eyes. Yeah. They say, yeah, I'm going to see that, and you know they're never going to go. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But it's but I, I think that uh, you guys are able to make that happen. That's the story of my life, by the way. You know, <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a Civil War movie, but it's a fascist, anti-fascist fairy tale. Oh. <laughs> Where do we validate the parking? Uh, you know? <laughs> Let's see. Now, this... This, I mean, I've read the, this particular idea. Daniel Krauss was part of the, the way this one started. Crucial, yeah. Yeah. Can you talk about that? Well, I, I have tried many ways of trying to do the idea of the, the love story. Always uh, incomplete. I never liked it. Yeah. And then Daniel, uh, during a breakfast in 2011, we, he, uh, I said, what, are you, what else are you working on? And he said, I have this idea of a janitor that uh, befriends... Uh, a creature in a in a in a cylinder and uh, in a government facility and takes it home. Huh. And I thought, that's it. <laughs> that's that that's that's the key to do it with the smaller, invisible, disfranchised characters yeah. that come together to save the ultimate other. Yeah. You know, yeah. it, it it came. What happens with me that is curious is. A lot of it comes all at once, like a, like a song. Yeah, yeah. But then there are areas that are black that I cannot access, and then it takes, for example, with Pan's Labyrinth, uh, I took six months to write the opening ten pages. Wow. And I wouldn't move, and I wouldn't move, and then when I understood that the blood needed to flow backwards to her nose, uh -huh. and I said, and then, and then I understood it's the ending, but it's not the ending, and I, immediately I wrote the rest in four weeks. Wow. The first draft. Wow. And with this, with Vanessa, I came to Vanessa with 40 pages of a script, and I, and I asked her uh, what her instincts were. And she said, you know, well, I think the Russian story could grow, and you, we could make more of the general and the relationship with Strickland. And immediately I thought, that's the black spot I didn't. I couldn't figure it out on my own at all. So why did you? I've got like a three-part question. Why did you think you wanted to work with someone? Why did you choose Vanessa? And Vanessa, why did you want to do this? Well, I I knew after trying from 2012 to 2014 and getting to 40 uh, odd pages of a scream and with all the beats you see, all the main beats, the 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 ending, the beginning, the the escape, blah blah blah. But all of them were there was a piece missing, a huge piece missing. And in 2014, I. Uh, went to Alexander Dinelaris 
who had co-written Birdman with Alejandro. Yeah. We had several meetings, but it couldn't work. And then I came to LA and I met with three or four writers. And the moment you meet with them, you know. Yeah, and okay. with, with Vanessa, I met and I said, what do you think about the story? And her reaction to the story was all at once intelligent, but m very moved and beautiful. And and uh, I think it took two meetings or one meeting, very quick. Yeah, over sushi. <laughs> very, not very, very tragic for the fish. <laughs> but uh, but we we met and 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 we connected really well. And then uh, I thought she's the one. And Vanessa, why did you think you know there's something I want to be part of? Well, from the beginning, when he told me the story, I, I saw how beautiful it would be. But I think I really, and so I, I was really interested in that, and I thought I understood the tone he was interested in, and I loved the idea that there were two people at the center of it who didn't speak, and they were surrounded by people who were sort of speaking but not saying anything. But I also really loved, I just um, had this impression that Guillermo was pursuing this in a very pure way, that he genuinely loved it, and that he just, it was a story he wanted to tell, and um, he just was going to tell it somehow, and that it really didn't matter to him all the rest of it, um, the business or the this or the that. And I really was attracted to th that creative spirit and felt like, oh, wow, I really want to be a part of that. Yeah. No, it sounds good. Now, how did you specifically work together? Every well, everyone who writes together does it a different way. Yeah, so I, I mean, I you guys did I've it. done it many, many times the, the same way because it works. Matthew Robbins and I co-wrote out six, seven screenplays. Uh, uh, I have co-written with writers in Spain, and most of that is long distance. So, uh, what I what I what we would do, or what I like, is I take over, uh, or they take over for a couple of weeks or a month. And then they, I don't talk about anything. I say, do whatever you want. Don't tell me, don't consult me. I'm going to cut, I'm going to add, do whatever you want. Because I know what you want to do by the time I get it back. Yeah. It's like custody with children. Yeah. You get them this weekend, <laughs> take them to the park. Next weekend, I'll take them to the ice cream. You know, it's, and, and, and I spoil them, you spoil them. And they come back and forth. And then we talk briefly on the phone of that. And I would say, why did you take that scene out? Why did you make it longer? Why did you feel we need... And we talk a little, and then, again, a long silence. Vanessa, how was it for you? I really enjoyed that communication. I thought it was funny how clearly I felt I could hear someone speaking to me, even though they weren't saying anything, by what changes were made to the script. I felt like it was an actual conversation where huh. I was like, Oh, you didn't like that, huh? Ha-ha. <laughs> I see. Um, and it was, I, I thought that was really intriguing. And I really enjoyed having the freedom to do whatever I thought would make it the best. And I also, I really enjoy. I felt like Guillermo was bringing this huge creativity to it that some of the scenes were so unpredictable to me, so surprising. And from the, from the early point, I thought, I've got to bring the same level of, creativity and I thought it was very challenging because I'm normally a little more logic and structure based and I just thought I'm going to just try to see what crazy thing I can think of because that you know that that's sort of what he's looking for and I, I found that really fun. Yeah, yeah, no, sounds good. What I want to talk to you a little now about the, the move to the actors, you know, who are really extraordinary and you know I was thinking when I was thinking about this, you know, I've seen the film multiple times but all of a sudden I started thinking that the, the focused on the enormous kind of the difference between Sally Hawkins and Michael Shannon, that they are really, there's a lot of characters in the film, but they are yeah. the intense antagonists. Well, the, the thing I've said before, but it's true, is I cast the eyes ah, of the actors. Okay. And the eyes are so different because, look, 90% of a movie is looks. Yeah, yeah. Somebody looking at each other, looking at a landscape, looking as they drive, looking as they walk. Films are made of gazes. Yeah, you know, yeah. people gazing at each other, etc. And I think that that's the main tool for me of an actor. When I cast uh, kids for Devil's Wagon or uh, any of the movies, I, I see how they look around, yeah. you know. Huh. And if you think symphonically, Sally Hawkins' eyes and Shannon's eyes are, you know, completely symphonically different. One is an oboe, the other one is a French horn, or you know, some and 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 uh, Octavia. Think of her eyes. Yeah, yeah. Each of those eyes have a different quality 
compassion, humanity, uh, intelligence, etc. And you you put them all together, Michael Michael Stuhlberg, you know. Yeah. And I go very much by the eyes, the, and and I feel the characters in the eyes, and and you're right, of course, having seen all the movies. Yeah. You yeah. see all the movies. I saw I saw all the movies uh, that I could of Shannon, of Stuhlberg, or everyone. And you tailor it. You tailor it. It's like a song. You huh. know their range, and you write the music and the song yeah. for their range, and to push them a little. How early on did you cast it? I wrote it for them. You wrote it for I them? I wrote it wow. for them. I, I literally, the moment I started, my kids and I were watching a movie called Submarine, and I said, I saw Sally, and I said, I'm going to write the movie for her. Really? Yeah. Wow. I didn't know her. I mean, I knew who she was from yeah. Mike Lee and all that. Yeah, yeah. But I, I thought she was phenomenal in that movie, and I said, that's her. Wow. And then Shannon, same thing. Octavia was probably the, the earliest I wanted to write for. Really? Uh, Richard Jenkins, I originally didn't write it for him. I was writing for John Hurt or Ian McKellen. Uh -huh. Very different, you know? Yeah, yeah. And, and, uh, and, and then I, I thought about Albert Brooks. Huh. It was very strange that because be what yeah. I thought it was a very interesting choice for the character, and then I saw Jenkins in a in a movie that he makes an amazing part uh, sing a movie called Bone Tomahawk, oh, and he's yeah. so great. He plays a character called Chicory, and I thought, dear Lord, <laughs> I mean, because I saw him on The Visitor, yeah, which yeah. is a, a masterpiece of performance. Yeah, yeah. But then you see him do something so different. I said, this is the guy. Yeah. How does it work? Do you ask them ahead of time? Do you say, I'm interested, I can't show you well, anything, but yeah, I want you to do yeah. it? Yeah, no, I, I, talked to Sa I talked to Sally and I said that. I've done that a few times, yeah. sometimes to great pain, because, <laughs> because they call, is it ready? No, not yet. Is it ready? No, not yet. But I told, I told Sally uh, through her agent, I was writing for her. I, I told Shannon. Now, Shannon basically is like the honey badger. He doesn't give a f***. <laughs> you know? Well, that's sure. You know? Absolutely. <laughs> Now, Vanessa, are you involved in any of this? No, not at all. Although, of course, I knew, I had heard about the people who he had in mind, so I knew Sally yeah. from the beginning and so on. Yeah. Now, I read, Guillermo, that you actually uh, had, you, know, you work a lot with the actors before shooting. You, you did, a lot. Yeah, can you talk about why you do that and uh, what you do? I work a, a lot, a lot, a lot. I, there's, I do a lot of what is called table work, but I start before the actors show up. I, I, I start years before anyone comes on board wow. designing. Wow. Yeah. I, I start designing sets before anyone shows up with two or three people. Wow. In the, in the, and I start sculpting the creature three years before the movie. Wow. You know? And, 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 and it takes a long time to solve the visual coding of the movie for me. So when people show up, I already can tell them, these are the colors, this is what we're going to do, blah, blah, blah. And with the actors, what I do is I write, for most of the characters, I write an eight-page biography. Wow. With everything, a zodiac sign, what they eat, what they drink, what they read, what they listen to, what are their secrets, how they perceive themselves, how their people perceive them, blah, 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 blah. And then I give it to the actor and I say, use it if you want, don't use it if you don't. Yeah. And then I give it to the art department, to the wardrobe department, production design, and I say, these are the characters we need to make come to life. Show me in the wardrobe how you're proving all these qualities. Uh -huh. Show me in their home how they uh -huh. reflect who they are, you know, and, and the colors and the texture. And, the, and it's a single discipline. Uh, and, and the actor, then what you do, because tonally it's such a different movie, it's difficult because you need to go from comedy to thriller to this, and it needs to be seamless. You need to feel not that you're seeing a pastiche of little pieces, but that tonally is all of a piece. Yeah. And uh, what we do is, we, for example, Jenkins, I said, did you read the biography? I said, yeah. He said, do you like it? He said, no, nope, I don't know what I'm going to do. I said, that's fine. Uh, Richard, Michael Stuhlberg took it like a religion, huh. like it was the Bible. <laughs> but, uh, but I come from Minsk. I, go, I know, I know. <laughs> and he says, my accent is not Minsk. I said, well, go work on it. <laughs> but, but, uh, and, and it varies. Sally, uh, Octavia, you start seeing the chemistry. Yeah. And I start saying, you and Octavia go, go to dinner, and I'll join you, and we'll talk, or... We have almost psychotherapy <laughs> sessions, and then you do, and then you do a lot of table work where you analyze every piece of the screenplay, wow. every dialogue, every scene. How you're gonna do it? You try rehearsals, do different things. The actors find each other, and at the end, 
you have a camaraderie. And in all that process, for example, I kept Michael Shannon away. Huh, really? Yeah, he said, you're not invited to this. No kidding. No, no, because because I needed him to... to Little did I know that he didn't need any help. <laughs> I needed him to, to be completely uh, overwhelming as a presence, but yeah. he is. Yeah. He is. Yeah. He's, a, he's, a, he's an incredibly intense presence, yeah. Michael. Now you can feel it. You but what I like it. about him is, I think, I think he brings vulnerability to the yeah. world. So he yeah. makes you understand that underneath all that, there is a human. Yeah, yeah. No, it's true. It's true. Wow. Uh, what you know, you shot you know the the obviously it's called the shape of water. Water is very important. I had not heard of the way you shot a lot of the water. Uh, you know, we, we've all heard of day for night, but there is something that I'd never heard of until I read it about. It's your It's called, called dry for wet. Dry for wet. Can you describe what yeah. that is and how the, it works? The opening and the closing of the movie are completely shot without a drop of water. They are done in 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 smoke filled uh, sets, shot in slow motion. Everybody's suspended with wires, and all the props are suspended with wires. And uh, you have a video projector projecting what is called the caustics of the light of water. And uh, you use a fan to move the clothing and the hair of the actors as if they were underwater. When you go to close-ups, you can go for digital hair. And it gives you complete control, almost wow. like a tableau in an opera or in a painting. Wow. And I needed that th because the movie costed $19.3 million. Dollars. And I needed to make it look like it costed 70. Yeah. And in my ulcer, it costed 70. <laughs> in my liver, it costed 70. <laughs> but it costed 19.3. Yeah. And, and, and I couldn't build those sets underwater, so I came up with that. And uh, the only set that we did sink underwater is the bathroom. Ah. That I needed to do because you have pl a plastic curtain and he's moving with her. Yeah. And you cannot reproduce that naked with the wires. Yeah. And all that, that huge flood, how was that? That huge flood, when he opens the door, is yeah. digital. Really? Yeah. Wow. What we did is we, we found a really good fluid system uh, for, for, the, for the moment. And I, I, uh, I did a couple of tricks. Like uh, Normally, you just put the water. But I had a couple of objects on the floor move. Ah. And they were digital. So it, they would move. And one was with a little wire. And it looks like the water is pushing stuff. Yeah. Wow. Wow. <laughs> is that fun for you, That's all that stuff? That's second nature. I mean, my discipline is I took three years of screenplay writing, but then I took also with Dick Smith, the Oscar-winning oh, yeah. makeup yeah. effects yeah. artist, I took a course on makeup effects that taught me how to break everything into elements. And then I owned, for a decade, I owned a company that did um, optical printing, stop-motion animation, wow. physical effects, special effects. All to do my short films, all to do my my cre my weird uh, super eights, and 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 what it does, and I'm a, an okay painter and an okay sculptor, so I'm very fast at breaking down the elements mm -hmm. we need. Wow, that's amazing. What was it? How did you do it for such a small amount of money? I mean, it seems cool. a, it's astonishing. Yeah, it was, <laughs> it was astonishing. I mean, I honestly, we did everything from the little tricks to the big tricks. Like a little, for example, in a big movie, you cast 500 extras if it's period, yeah. and you do 500 haircuts, 500 makeup, 500 shirts, 500 skirts, 500. And what we did here is we used reused the extras. Huh. They already had a haircut, so the guy that walks in the street is going to be in the lab with a with a, oh, a, yeah. a notepad, wow. and the girl that uh, is in the soda shop, she's going to be in the lab or in the dining room or you know. And you just reuse them. Wow. And you, you, the guy that has a white shirt gets a jacket on top or gets a robe. Or, I mean, and, and normally you wouldn't do that. Then uh, what we did is um, there was uh, on The Strain, a series I was producing for FX, mm, we shot a season and then the next season was a few months later. So I said, I, we needed to hold for the show, right? Yeah. So I talked to Fox and I said, in the hiatus, in between the two seasons, yeah. I'll shoot my movie. Ah. So we got all that stage space uh, <laughs> because it was already reserved. Ah. But to give you an example, uh, we needed to do the bathroom and sink the bathroom because when, when, when you see a set uh, inundated, you're not filling it with water. You're sinking it in water. Ah. Because to construct a set that can withstand the pressure, internal pressure of the... You can't. Yeah. You would need reinforced steel. 
Mm. It would be a, a, so what we do is w we were walking one day on the set and I see four iron um, uh, beams s sunk on the floor and I measured the beams mm -hmm. and I measured the distance from the lens to the bathroom that I needed and I built the bathroom to fit in between those four beams and we put this sort of um, Sanford and Son summer pool you know, like we, we did we did the Mexican technique. We put just walls around those we put we cinch them and we fill it with water. Wow. It was not a uh, a pool that you would bring uh, friends to, but you know, we filled it with water and we sank the bathroom. Wow. In that one. And we had to measure literally. Uh, I needed to know in one eighty five what lens I was gonna use and when I would be shooting outside of the set and what distance you need, because what a lot of people think, when you think of building a set, uh, your lens is encompassing, is like a V, right? Your lens is encompassing the set, but there's a dead space between you and the set. Yeah. That's what you need, depending on the length of the, uh, of the lens. If you're curious, for example, on Crimson Peak, in order to look the, at the foyer of the house complete, I built a little black room at the entrance that I call the black chamber, Huh. So that the lens could capture the whole, uh -huh. the whole thing, and wow. we knew that in pre-production. Wow, it's hmm. amazing. Vanessa, were you in? You, did you visit the set? Were you involved no, at all once not, the lighting was over? Not With 19.3, <laughs> I didn't invite my parents. I would have had to pay for a tour. <laughs> so what, Vanessa? When you saw it for the first time, what did you think? Because you'd been probably no one had been more intimately involved who hadn't yeah. seen it. I was really astounded at the scope of it, although I had been, in, I, I mean, I think I've seen all of Guillermo's films, but I was particularly taken with the beauty and the epic sort of uh, nature and the colors of Crimson Peak. So I wasn't surprised at the sort of luxurious sort of depth of it and all the color, but I, I was stunned at the sort of scope because I had known that it wasn't being made for that much money, and I just thought, how on earth did this happen? And and and, and um, the Crimson Peak was fifty-five. Wow! So much, much, much more. Wow! That's kind of amazing. Yeah. It, well, yeah. they don't. They always look like more. <laughs> you know, you never. You, I have a, 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 a Troll Hunters. We do a, an animated series that we also try to make look really expensive. And I always, when I meet with my guys, I say they have a sign that is a saying I have that says. Your expectations should always exceed the budget, <laughs> you know, because that's the work of a director. Yeah. You need yeah. if they give you thirty, it needs to look like eighty. Yeah. If they give you a hundred, it needs to look like two hundred. Wow. You know, I mean, it's it's harder to say it with something like Pacific Rim, because it was one ninety five but looked like three hundred. <laughs> but that sounds like yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah but it's a decimal point. Yeah. You know, yeah. Chronos was one ninety five. They were uh, Pan's Labyrinth and this one, 19 point, uh, and Pacific Rim, 195. Wow. The problems, the same. Same, same problem. <laughs> what was the hardest thing about this one? In terms Sur of surviving. Surviving. Yeah. We had, we had, is one of the hardest shoots I've ever had. Uh, we had everything against us, everything, every day, except for one day. We had major crisis. Wow. Uh, weather, uh, traffic, uh, disasters, natural. Uh, adversity, blah, 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 blah. And, and my job as director is you shouldn't notice any of that. Uh, you should think, oh, it was unlimited budget, unlimited time, it's all luscious. That's my goal. Yeah. My goal is uh, I'm the goalie, <laughs> and you're trying to get the ball into the... And I, I have to stop it. Got to kick it out. Yeah, yeah. You, but there was a lot of kicking. <laughs> this, this, movie, this movie was difficult. Like we have, to give you an example, the, the scene where Shannon tortures... Uh, uh, Stuhlberg in the yeah. sa in the sand pits yeah. with all yeah. the giant sand. Yeah. Well, it was sub-zero temperature. Oh my God! And we and winds, hurricane-level winds that were hitting the sand, and the sand was literally embedding on everything and everyone. Oh. If you were a human, they were the sa you found sand in places that shall never be mentioned. <laughs> and a lot of sand, by the way. <laughs> and and if it if I mean you were a camera equipment. Sand was breaking the lens, breaking, oh getting, God. jamming in, and we were losing cameras. We were losing the crane, oh. was malfunctioning, and then we had rain on top of that, oh sub zero, and we had half an hour or an hour to shoot the scene, really wow. quick. And you know, you, and this is like one, but 
Uh, there's one. Uh, do you know the story of the lamppost? Anyone? Okay, I'll tell you that story because that <laughs> defines what a director does very beautiful. <laughs> well, when we were scouting uh, the exterior of the cinema, yeah. which we put the marquee, it was a theater, yeah. and uh, I scout and I said, I want a, a, a crane. When Eliza comes looking for the creature, I want this Douglas Cirque, low low angle crane, you know, as she moves around and yeah. and we and we spot it and we say, oh, there's a lamppost. We cannot use that crane. Uh, I want to have to settle for a dolly. Blah blah. blah. I'm really unhappy. The day comes a horrible day. Everything goes wrong. We were supposed to use a drone, and there were winds, and the drone ended up in Mississauga. You know, it just flew away. It couldn't be stable. Sally goes up the stairs, and she says, I have vertigo. I say, now you tell me? <laughs> you know, Everything starts going bad, and then comes the moment where we're going to shoot Shannon arriving in the car. He gets out of the car, goes up the steps. We do what is called a, a Texas switch, because those stairs are not connected, if you see it again. So it's Shannon going up the stairs below, and another guy dressed like Shannon on the stairs above. Oh, my gosh. And I, I lose him for a second, and you think it's the same guy, but it's not. Ah. That's what is called the Texas switch. Oh and we're doing the Texas switch, and first take, beautiful. What Shannon have not told anyone, somehow, is that he really didn't know how to drive. <laughs> He had driven in the past, but that's like me going to a synagogue, you know, I don't go that often. You know, it's, 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 it's really, he, he gets into the car, and he, and he, the second take, he gets out of the car, he leaves the car in drive, the car keeps driving without him, he tries, jumps to try to stop it, the car won't stop, we see the car coming, I'm here on the video, I see the car is coming, there, there's a tent between us, but the car is coming to kill us, all. Oh. And the car goes and destroys the first lamppost. The lamppost falls in a shower of sparks. And, and, and everybody says, run! Which to me, I don't understand that word. I, it's like speaking another language. I go, I never run. Yeah. So I go, I'm going to die. And, and, the, and the car hits the final post, which is concrete, and stops. Wow. And everybody is horrified. I come out and I say, I can do my crane. Because <laughs> the post is gone. <laughs> That's a great story. You know, I just have one, one day of shooting. One day of shooting. <laughs> you saw, you saw Dark, Dark, uh, Darkest Hour? Yeah. Did you guys see Darkest Hour? Well, that's what the shoot was like. Like it was a <laughs> Monday. And horrible things would happen. And then Tuesday. And you would go, it's only Tuesday? <laughs> you know... The f one of the first times, we, you know, I met you, it's almost, you know, in, in Cannes last year, I ran into you at a party, and uh, which it sounds like it's the only party in Cannes, but I said, what are you doing? And you said, you know, I'm working on this little film, <laughs> you know, and uh, you thought it was little because of it was low budget, yeah. but it has captivated people. Yeah. Why do you think this has happened? I mean, this has become a real phenomenon. What I find is, and this is going to sound really corny, but it's real. Um, I, I, I'm not exactly a, a happy-go-lucky guy. I mean, you're, you're a storyteller. You're going to be yeah. bound to be an, a disillusioned optimist, you know? <laughs> and, and, and sometimes when I reach the bottom of the bottom of the bottom, I, there are certain movies that literally have convinced me that I should live. Yeah. Because I, I, I go, it's not that great, this life, is it? You know, and, and you're really at the bottom of your barrel and, and you go, and these movies come and rescue you. And that has happened to me with Devil's Backbone, Pan's Labyrinth, and this one. Those wow. are the three that have done it. Wow. Where I, I am at the bottom. I'm, everything is going wrong in my life one way or another. And, and these movies, even as uh, difficult as they are, they lift me out of that uh, morass. Yeah. And you think it did that for, for people as well? Well, well that's what, what I think is... Look, when people say, when people talk about success, it's a word I don't understand if it's not used about the depth of the connection. Because there are certain, the, the reason the movie is a, a, a song to cinema, and not great cinema, Sunday cinema, yeah, the yeah. one that you watched by accident on Sunday, mm -hmm. halfway through the movie, and it lifted you. Yeah, yeah. A comedy that you don't know why, but you're, like the end of Sullivan's Travels, right? Yeah, yeah. He doesn't know what's happening, but he's laughing. He's laughing. And he yeah. understands the purpose of cinema is to yeah. tell you, live. Yeah. Live a little, man. Yeah. Then stay another day. Yeah. 
And I wanted to make the movie that functioned like that, that would connect deeply with an audience. What I said, and is the way the movie has felt for me, I wanted to make a song that wow. people would come out of a theater humming. Wow. And that the feeling you have is the same you have in a convertible on PCH when a great <laughs> ballad comes on and you pump it and you start singing. That's the feeling I needed yeah. as a healing thing.